Hi, I'm Amy. I'm studying biochemistry at Bristol and I contacted Peter because I wanted to hear more about conservation in general and about rewilding um, and also how to pursue a career in conservation. Um, Peter, do you want to introduce yourself? Well, thanks, Amy. I, I'm Peter Smith. I've um, been a conservationist um, pretty much all my life. Um, originally, I worked mostly with the wildlife trusts. Then I formed my own charity, the, uh, the Wildwood Trust, and um, specifically for rewilding. And the last few years, I've been doing consultancy um, abroad uh, on rewilding projects. And I'm doing some work um, with various organizations now um, to try and promote rewilding and compassion and understand how we can do rewilding better. I've done some huge projects, as you may know. I've done many jobs um, from campaigning, fundraising, um, doing some of the first rewilding projects like reintroducing beaver, doing large-scale uh, woodland grazing um, rewilding. I've, I've put together the project for having bison back into uh, Britain and rewilding. Um, I've, I've done all kinds of animal breeding for release, um, dormice, red squirrels, um, as well as beavers. So I've, I've ran two zoos, um, learned how to be very good at everything from habitat restoration to how to breed animals in large numbers like water voles for re-release. So I've got a big, broad picture of everything. I'm very interested in things like disease, very complex interactions between wildlife and habitat restoration and population modeling, because that's my first uh, master's degree was population modeling um, and, and all that kind of stuff. So that's what I am. I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. Great. It's impressive to hear the amount of things that you can cover over a career. Um, my first question was, I was wondering, like, when you're thinking about rewilding an area, how do you define what its natural state was in the first place? Well, that's that's a how long's a piece of string question. <laughs> um, a, a koan, as the Buddhists would say, an insolvable problem, but in understanding the insolvable problem, we gain enlightenment. So what is natural, right? And it, I suppose the, the big debate that's been going on with rewilding is when I started in nature conservation, people thought farming like a 18th century farmer was a natural state. And we tried to define habitats as having these green winged orchids or, or that butterfly in them. And then we tried to manage them in a state of woodland management, such as chestnuts coppicing, which of course is quite recent as it was an economic activity. Um, it's not natural. Heathlands, which are not natural, it's man-made habitat. Um, and uh, certain types of meadows, right? And so you can see that that has got more nature, but it's not natural. And where do we go for as we move back in time? Are we talking, are we talking a thousand years ago where a large part of Britain was actually managed for pasture of cows, woodland pasture, which had huge amounts of nature, dwarf scrub, uh, which has got fantastic nature in it. Or are we going to go back to the Stone Age where you started having man seriously affecting nature and there was, um, you know, the burnings and, and cut and burn agriculture and stuff like that. Are we going to go into glacial where we had elephants roaming around uh, Britain. Um, we had hippopotami uh, roaming around. Um, and these mega herbivores had a, a significant effect. Um, so it, 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 it's a question of understanding history and what nature lived, how our habitats were. If we go back to Stone Age, 25 to 30% of the UK was beaver habitat. It was all beaver dams and beaver affected habitats. Um, if you go back 
previously to 80,000 years ago, you had mega herbivores, you know, roaming around. And, and all of our, our woodland species are actually mostly adapted to having a mega mega herbivore having an elephant go through it having cave bears and smilodons and all that kind of stuff so you know it was where what is natural and you can see why i said it's how long's a piece of string so what i prefer to see is we're looking at high biodiversity habitats that mimic natural processes within the confines of practicalities of land ownership what is feasible on that land um I wrote some notes, so I will, um, yeah. So it's it's all about trying to get natural processes, trying to essentially put as little effort in as possible, little spend as little money, but get maximum biodiversity out of the back end of how you're going to manage land and get habitat restoration. And connectivity of habitat super important. So how are you going to have biodiversity hotspots and link them all together so species can flow backwards and forwards? That's that's as natural as you're going to get it in our world. Peggy, that's fair. So do you think as well, as like it sounds like you kind of partially choose what best fits you for a natural process? Do you think well, and, until we tackle the question of area of land, it's always going to be man affected. You know, we can't just go and take half of Scotland and let it go as much as I'd love to. You know, we've only got so many bits of land. So most of my work, I mean, my last job, I'm not allowed to talk about it, but it, it wasn't in the UK, did have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of square miles to play with. And so you could get more expansive on doing real rewilding. But in the UK, you know, you're going to have 50 acres there, maybe a thousand acres there if you're lucky. And, and of course, you've got to manage the practicalities of that, all the licensing requirements, you know, getting licenses for um, wild boar or, or um, bison or whatever. And you've got to manage the populations. Otherwise, things go wrong. You can't go like the bit of disaster they had at Ustalsvadarsplassen, where they, they allowed too many animals without predation. So... You've got to think of animal welfare. You've got to think of the practicalities of it. So anybody who says they've got the answer is wrong because it's a complex series of judgments you have to make. Minimizing man and effort and maximizing biodiversity. Okay, yeah, thanks. That makes a lot of sense. And I can tell that it's, it's a question that we could talk about for a long time. Forever. <laughs> yeah. Um, something else I was wondering is what do you think are kind of the best strategies of dealing with like highly invasive species? Because I know when I was in Scotland, I noticed there were rhododendrons like, everywhere. And when researching how to deal with that, it looked like a lot of the ways people deal with it, like pesticides and burning, which seems like quite high effort strategies. So I was wondering if you have any ideas of how to deal with that. Right. Absolutely. So let's talk about rhododendron, something very much on my mind at the moment because the project I'm planning at the moment is, is getting rid of the rhodi. Now, the, any high effort strategy is doomed to failure. Um, I know we were talking before about um, crayfish, you know, signal crayfish. So we have tried very effective measures high intensive measures to get rhododendron the classic one is you mechanically chop it up you you burn it grind it it's poisonous so it affects the soil you then um, systemic pesticide on the the roots that you chop off um going into the roots from the stems and then you spray every year for the new ones so, so there's all these ways of controlling it there's government legislation supposedly forcing us to do that but it's never been enforced, so it's useless. Um, in, in any legislation that isn't enforced is useless. Um, there's many projects where people have spent a lot of time and effort doing it. And the sum total of that is we're not making a difference. In fact, it's getting worse. So now we're putting on the economist's hat, the business manager's hat. How do you have effective control of rhododendron? Or how do you save the white-clawed crayfish uh, from the others? So with rhododendron, we can see that wild boar don't like rhododendron, right? 
Now, a word of caution. Any rewilding program, you can have too much rewilding. You can have too much grazing, right? Browsing. And that destroys habitats. But a light touch over an extended period of time, animals like um, wild analogs of cows, oroxen, and their deer, um, wild horses, um, any horse, uh, pigs, instead of wild boar, can, on a light grazing regime, control rhododendron. Takes many years. Where rhododendron is really infested, you might have to do a single um, clearing and pesticide use because it's so ingrained in the habitat, it's virtually possible to get rid of. But then, and that's that's one of the projects I'm, I've been working on, is trying to get that rewilding to affect um, uh, non-native species. When we come now, let's have a look, think. The rhododendron issue is complex, and you have to. It's going to take decades to sort it out. But mechanical people control is unfeasible. It's not working. All the scientific studies show, and it's getting worse because we just don't have enough people and machines, and the methods have got lots of pesticide herbicides and cause problems and all this kind of stuff. Um, and rhododendron, many problems, you know, it causes uh, flooding because the soil's uh, ruined. It doesn't absorb water. It's got many problems. We need to tackle it. But nature has the best answers. Again, let's talk about um, signal crayfish, nasty invasive signal crayfish coming in, gobbling up our poor native crayfish. But what's happened? We've changed our rivers. Every habitat is man-adapted. It's the same with rhododendron. Why is rhododendron taking core control? It's because of our forestry practices. Everything from chestnut coppice right through to modern plantations, if it's not maintained, rhododendron as a pioneer species, as a generalist species, will come and occupy um, areas that we've been screwing around with. While the naturally adapted habitats are far better at resisting invasive species that are being brought brought in. When we then start rewilding, we'll notice that where you get beavers, you don't get um, Himalayan balsam, right? Where you get natural habitats, you don't have this susceptibility to these pioneering and generalist invasive species. So it's all about trying to create the habitat. Now, what might get rid of signal crayfish? Otters. Okay. So yeah. otters have been happily getting rid of all those nasty North American mink better than any other man-adapted process because where they come in, they won't tolerate them. It's, it's more complex than just as a general statement, but it, it's pretty true because we've been seeing North American mink numbers going down. That means the waterfall goes up. Also, how do you get otters back? So this is what got me into rewilding. This is the story that got me into rewilding. Many moons ago, young man, same sort of situation you are now. I read a paper that was translated from R Russia. And there was also some papers from, from um, Norway in Finland talking about beavers. And on a, I was interested in the maths because I was a computer modeling guy and habitat and population modeling. And they were talking about where you got beavers, you had twice the concentration of otters. And I was interested in otter conservation. Of course, back then, otters had not returned. Most of them had been wiped out in the 60s due to pesticides um, and hunting. And they were now just on the cusp of returning. Now, happily, they've returned because we stopped killing them. But we also stopped polluting all the rivers. And so they didn't pesticides didn't concentrate into their skin and kill their offspring. So we've actually made something better. But when the otters started returning, we started seeing various changes in the habitat. But when you've got beavers, you can have twice as many otters, roughly. And that means we can have more otters. And then they have all their little population cascades around it. It's just like with the beavers affecting the elk grazing, that then the wolves affecting the elk grazing that allows the beavers to return the famous story of you know, wolves and rivers, right? Beavers are central as the key 
stone species that is central to you know 30 percent of the uk and you know all that carbon gets sucked back into the pt soils that they create so we're creating the kind of resilient habitat that will adapt to climate change and adapt to invasive species so your otter your beaver your otter get your your um, water voles back but that also will allow you to deal effectively with signal crayfish because the rivers have to be in a certain way to favor your white clawed crayfish the native crayfish against the invasive one <laughs> and that's probably the only long-term sanctuary because paper after paper have shown that crayfish control does not work all over europe and there's numerous papers you can you can download. And to everybody out there, remember, if you're not part of a university, go don't use Google. Go and get DuckDuckGo or whatever. Type in LibGen and you can get whatever paper you want. So we can break the monopoly of um, control. That's what I do. I read many papers every week, love it, and learn lots from the scientific community without monopoly. I mean, there's so many other examples. We're getting pine martens back, Hattenden Island, happening in Northumberland, where I'm from. So we're getting the red squirrels back. Yeah, the red squirrels can now outcompete the greys. We reconnect. We're putting back into nature the processes that have been lost. And that's what rewilding is all about. It's about natural processes, recreating where nature saves itself. Doesn't take man, doesn't take a vast office of fundraisers or administrators. We just need to start getting to the basics of rewilding. Okay, that makes sense. Kind of restarting natural processes rather than going, this species is everywhere. We need to concentrate on just this. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of my other questions is I was thinking, where do you think energy is best spent when trying to? reduce the climate crisis and improve biodiversity because I guess as someone who really loves nature I would love to be outside all the time and doing a job which involves mostly that but do you think energy is better spent investing in trying to change policies and yeah I guess the way things are currently organized again this is a question that has no right answer right <laughs> You have to be happy with what you do. You have to choose, and you have to have the rally realities of, of you know earning some money and and living and all that kind of stuff. You need fundamentally both things. You need all things. You need to be able to be a communicator. You might find that being a, you know for many years I spent I focused on fundraising and marketing. Um, even though I I desperately wanted to be a conservationist but that was my door to getting rewilding started and i'll bore you with some stories about that later on uh, how um the beaver project and others came from essentially fundraising administrative administrating funds um so that but you need to learn all the skills um of where it is now politics is dangerous most political campaigners lobbyists are utterly ineffective yeah so i would be cautious about saying become a campaigner you need to learn about campaigning you need to learn about politics but the more you become a politician the more you realize it's useless because the system don't think that becoming an mp is going to help you change the world. In fact, most MPs I know will say they have got no power whatsoever because we don't live in a democracy. We live in an oligarchy. And there is a, you know, they make sure that the people who actually get to the top of political parties, so you can vote for Jack Johnson or John Jackson. That is your two options. <laughs> Your democracy, you can have Keir Starmer or Rishi Sunak. How are their policies any different? It's just what they open their mouths to is the actual policies are hardly different at all. They're never going to change anything. And what happens when you get somebody who does want to change things? A Boris Johnson wants to change things. Well, he's immediately um, set upon. Or, or Jeremy Corbyn, he wanted to change things and actually was really democratic the 
Labour Party still wants to have a Jeremy Corbyn, but they're never going to get to vote for a Jeremy Corbyn again, are they? You get Keir Starmer or Keir Starmer or Keir Starmer or son of Keir Starmer. You will never get a person with who represents Democrats. You will only get John Jackson or Jack Johnson. So politics is like hitting a sponge. You know, it bounces straight back. But you've got to learn what is politics. So you don't don't negate that. But then you need to be a conservationist. You need to demonstrate. You need to show. Show, don't tell. Be the change. Get in there and do something that shows the world can change. When I did the Beaver Project with John McAllister all those years ago, God, 20, 25 years ago we started the project, it was hated by everybody. I had to do all kinds of things to make it happen. Nobody wanted it. Everybody was against it. But I managed to make a change, and that was by getting through to the then environment secretary, Michael Meacher. We got the project approved, but then people tried to stop it, and it was a meeting with Michael Meacher where he just cut all the red tape and allowed us to go through with it. And so making political connections is super useful, and now and again, you can get that change. And then all the cascade from that persuading uh, TV presenters like Chris Packham to get, because nobody, all the big wildlife programs wouldn't cover beaver. It was too sensitive, right? And Chris Packham, you know, chatting with him, he said he wanted to go and he's got his own little program where he had editorial control. He put beaver on there. And then slowly everybody adopted beaver. So now you create the change. And then people see that it's a good idea and then they adopt it. And mm -hmm. it now everybody wants beavers and all that kind of stuff and success as many fathers. Um, but you can see that going and doing practical things is good as well. So I, I'll, one day I'll get my autobiography out. But one of the key moments I, I think about was right at the end of university, after we'd finished our finals, I was sitting around in the bar with all my friends and we we're talking about making a change. We all wanted to make the change. That's on the mind of so many graduates at the start of their career. And yet so many people lose hope and spirit because I'm an autistic nutcase. I have never changed my will. You know, it, it, I've never been defeated in that sense. And I said, as long as I can make a tiny difference, just a tiny difference, I'll work hard at it. And I won't be um, dissuaded. So don't think about whether you're going into politics or you're going to go into uh, to political lobbying or campaigning or learn economics. You've got to learn economics. You must politics. Learn political science, learn about how politics really works. It'll disgust you, but you've got to learn how it works. Learn economics. Once again, learn real economics. It'll disgust you. All the stuff you see on mainstream TV is rubbish economics. It's not how the economy works. It's Most of it's just uh, fiddled to allow rich people to keep rich and poor people to remain subservient to the rich oligarchs, right? Political, sci um, political economic science learn the real stuff yeah and go and do something where you demonstrate that you're doing something good even though our whole political and economic system rewards people who do bad things and punishes people who do good things yeah yeah so do something good show it to the world keep on there um my the qualities you need in life are courtesy integrity perseverance self-control and an indomitable spirit Great. No, that's that's a really nice answer. I think it's nice to hear that it's not just policy, it's also like showing that it works and having the will to show that it works. Show, don't tell. Be the change. Because you're never going to persuade people by talking. You only persuade people by doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another question I had was around land ownership. So I was looking at um, you were saying that one of the ways to improve funding and the power dynamics around conservation was in taxing land ownership, which is something that makes a lot of sense. Um, but 
at one point I wanted to be a vet and I did a lot of work experience with farmers and I know the farmers that I personally worked with were really connected to the land and they really cared but they were also very much on their last legs and they weren't making a profit from what they were doing and I was wondering if you had any ideas of bringing them with us in like the root party movement. Of course. Some of my best friends are small-scale farmers. I know a few big farmers. These people have knowledge beyond what we have in dealing with the land and managing the land. They, they, so I don't... Uh, Winston Churchill's got a great speech um, about this very issue um, about land ownership and responsibility um, where he advocates land value tax. Um, and look it up. It's the 1909 Glasgow speech. Do a little search and you'll find it very famous. Um, so we know that people live on the margin where you have, they understand the concept of the margin in economics and science and ecology. Where people live on the margin, they're not going to be earning any money. Below the margin, they're actually losing money to work on the land above the margin. If you subsidize, you just move the margin so more land will be used and you destroy more wildlife. So we want to actually move the margin where more land becomes wild land. It's not economic to farm land. But that, of course, is going to affect people who own the um, marginal, submarginal land because all the money accrues to the landowner. That's the problem. We live in a society where we tax people's wages and we don't tax the profits from owning monopolies. Land is the biggest, the mother of all monopolies, as Winston Churchill told us. Um, it's not the only monopoly, but it is the mother of all monopolies. Um, so we need a system that rewards work and effort and people doing good things where people protect the nature, where people provide food to feed people. This all should be rewarded. And so we need not to tax this. So stop taxing people's wages. Stop taxing people's trade, that. No more national insurance, no more VAT, right? Get rid of it. It's a tax on the poor, really, because rich people don't earn money that way, do they? right it's also you've got a tax externality where you hurt things and then you need to reward the good things if you go and create a carbon sink if you go and create not like a plantation owners because plantation woodland actually releases carbon it doesn't absorb carbon that's a big it's another bugbear of mine people trading in carbon you need to reward people for uh, um, allowing ecosystem services on their land you need to reward people for, um, you know, a free market, a proper free market and food without externality. It all gets back. You've got to understand the concept of monopoly and externality to understand economics, right? Monopoly is where you hurt others or the environment. Monopoly is where you have a, a ownership of a limited thing or a government granted right. And profits from monopoly and profits from externality are bad so you must tax them or you must prevent them in a legal instrument if you do that you will find that farmers with knowledge how to farm but without polluting will be rewarded they will have more jobs so the land value tax is perfect for rural jobs it'll the the way economics works is if you have taxes on wages it it disproportionately affects areas in rural areas the farther you're away from the the economic centers the more those taxes hurt you and um, this is well known in what's known as ricardo's law of rent right back to the basics of economics got to understand ricardo's law like pushing people to the margins because the rents and the prices of cities and the areas close to the city are are um so expensive it stops you if you tax these economic rents these land value tax externalities it will help make best use of the farmland we have so we don't need to farm out but it will also allow economic activity in rural areas to be much higher 
So it all gets, I know this sounds so esoteric, it's so out of the world, but the more you understand economics, the more you understand that we don't need subsidies, we don't need um, the government, we just need the government to get off the backs of people who are trying to make a living. And farmers in really rural areas will make some money, but they need to have less uh, stocking density so they don't affect nature and they need to explore other ways of earning money and that would be greatly advanced rural economies will flourish under a system of land value tax trouble is it won't flourish for the landowners it'll flourish for the workers and that's why it won't happen because they'll fund all the lobbyists and political agencies and the nfu and the countryside landowners association will lobby oh it'll make us poorer yeah the few landowners will be poorer, but most of Britain is owned by 3,000 families. Yeah. yeah. So those people and their hangers-on, their lawyers and their bankers, they're going to be poorer, but actual 95% of the people will be super better off with better incomes and those what they every aspect of what they do. Once you get taxes on monopoly and externality, Everything you do will now be directed to causing less damage to nature, less damage to other people through exploiting your monopoly control over them. So their, their, their jobs will flourish. We'll have higher wages. There'll be far higher jobs. And the work we do will have less of an impact on nature. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it's kind of about convincing those people as well that those changes will benefit them when there's like lobbying against yes and of course most people aren't really up on these things so they think earning an extra 10 grand every year from their house price going up is their source of true wealth when actually they're being taxed on their real work and their kids can't afford a house and you know we've we've entered a nightmare economy and we're going to lose our preeminence because we're spending so much money on monopoly, on financial monopolies, you know, City of London. We're not doing anything real, you know, and this is why we're going to uh, we're going to get poorer and poorer and poorer until we reverse this trend of allowing money just to accumulate into property, property values going. And we're not talking property. We're talking monopoly. It's not your house that gets more expensive. Your house doesn't increase by 10 percent every year it's the land it's the location value so and why should you earn money for doing nothing sitting on your butt i'm sorry but if you want some money you should go out and work for it and if we did have a system like that we'd have so much tax we could afford better schools and universities and hospitals and we could afford to give people real uh, welfare, where you know they get an excellent health care, unemployment benefits, disability benefits, because there would be l less need because people could work and you wouldn't be have a poverty trap. If you do some work, you're not going to lose your benefits or anything. So you've got to think about all that of benefits being a sort of citizen's dividend. You know, if you're going to have a carbon tax, you give everybody a set amount of carbon they can use for free. And then they have to pay a higher tax afterwards. If you use water, everybody should get a set amount free. And then if you use more than that, you get more taxed on it. OK, so it's all about that efficiency of use. But we give everybody a baseline to so there's no more poverty. Poverty disappears. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, I think my last question was more um, it was like, so I'm going to graduate as biochemist next year. Um, what would you advise me to to get the qualifications I need to work in conservation? Um, and would you recommend conservation to me? Um, it's it's a tough workplace, right? And if you're, I my first degree was biochemistry. I did medical biochemistry. I then um, searched around to look for. Um, PhDs in, in what I wanted to do, but because I was into evolutionary um, genetics, the only PhDs you could do really for drug companies, truth be to honest. You know. So there's very little good research or career paths in academia unless you follow the money. And there's no money, certainly when I was um, graduating, in what I wanted to do. 
Okay, so I was, um, I was actually interested. My true thing that I was interested was entropy and uh, evolution, right? Entropy is uh, a very poorly understood concept. The more you get to understand it, you know it kind of answers all the question of what is life, the universe, and everything. And understanding how entropy is part of life and um, or negative entropy, how all life is effectively a way of combating entropy, right? So that's that's what I really, and I still want to do that. And evolution is just the process of getting more efficient at creating stability, shall we say, life um, for the given energy in the parts. Smith's second law, as I like to call it. But um, anyway, I couldn't do that. So next best thing, I wanted to get into nature conservation. So I went and did a practical course. I went and joined the National Trust um, in countryside management because I was looking at um, as a, as a training for work thing. And I got myself a grant to go and study at the first ever conservation biology degree at the Durrell Institute of Conservation Ecology. So I, I didn't hang around. I went to libraries and got little books. There's no web. Re well, there was no web as you know. There was no World Wide Web then. There were internet. But um, so I got very busy and I got accepted onto the master's program and I found a grant. Um, from the European Social Fund, who paid my way. So having that master's degree was good. These days, without a master's degree, it's pretty hard to do anything. Um, bachelor's degree, so there's a sad fact. And of course, with master's degrees, it's normally just the rich kids that do it. I, from a humble mining fa family, who um, whose father was unemployed at the time, um, you know, miner strike and all that, I had to go and get my own cash. So. That's that's that one. Then after that master's degree, I then had to get a job in nature conservation, which ain't easy. Right? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it probably there's more jobs now, but there's more competition for it. When I was getting into nature conservation, there was hardly any jobs at all. It was everybody thought I was a complete idiot um, uh, for wanting to pursue a career, but. I'm autistic, so I don't listen to anybody else and just do whatever I want. And eventually, after doing some um, work for a couple of research places and then a bit more volunteering, I landed a job as a volunteer at Scottish Wildlife Trust. And I was interested in campaigning because I, I wanted to change the world just like you did. There was no difference. We both wanted to make the world a better place. And I learned the arts of campaigning there. Originally, I was a volunteer, and then I finally earned, raised the money to pay for my own job, um, at which point I found a job, and therefore I didn't. It's always the same. I always raise money for projects that I never benefit from. So it's, it's, it's it, anyway, that's a, a little thing. So learning how to be an entrepreneur is, is really important, right? And when I was at Scottish Wildlife Trust, I went and got free courses. You could do free courses with the um, schools. You know, they do NVQs, SVQs in Scotland. Not very qualified. So I became not very qualified in things like desktop publishing. You know, that, that's what you needed in the days when um, leaflets were more important than web development. These days, it's about social media and stuff like that. So I went and did some basic courses on that sort of stuff. And then I started doing a basic marketing course and I started learning. I started getting books, read them on PR because in campaigning, I wanted to be effective. Now, it's great sitting in an office with people yip, yap, yapping, but I wanted to get out there and make a difference on the things I wanted to do. And the PR people there were absolute garbage. They couldn't get onto the telly for toffee. So I started meeting a few journalists and learning from them, reading a couple of books. There's one called Moy Alley. She read a series of these books, PR and charities. I just read it cover to cover. I was learning political science, you know, 
I am. Um, I had a couple of courses in my master's degrees on political science, so I started reading all the books around that. Des Wilson's A to Z of advertising, Machiavelli, you know, all the panoply of books, yeah, um, on political science. You could so I just read and read and read, and slowly I started putting together how to be effective in my job, how to go out and ask for money how to get on the TV and radio and talk intelligently about a subject and be engaging. And that got me into my next job, which was in marketing at Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust. And then that's when I started getting really into understanding nature conservation and effectively at Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust, I trebled their income in three years. Nobody's done that in most charities. I mean, there are charities, there are people who are better than me, but in most charities, you don't get to triple their income in three years. Yeah. Um, and then it, I went on to Kent Wildlife Trust where I quadrupled their income yeah. in four years. So I've got a pretty good history of fundraising and mar not just fundraising, marketing, membership systems. I'm a nerd. I get into computers. I learned how databases work. I really got into... Because I was doing population modeling, I wasn't scared of computers. Fixing computers, I fixed everybody's computer. I got secondhand computers free from businesses and set them up. I networked. I did my first MBA. I did an MBA, and I did it on on using the internet in charities. And so I I got everybody networked. I got internet. Uh, I started sending out. I did all kinds of comparative studies of online marketing and stuff like that. So you can see that I'm super. Uh, focused and I learned all these skills so the kind of skills you fundraising marketing and we're not talking marketing as people who stand around oh doesn't that look pretty no we're talking about databases we're talking about understanding what's effective being able to set up comparisons so you know this this works better than that and stuff like that you know so many morons in marketing it doesn't even begin you know if I hear one person say I want to rebrand and that's going to make us I'll punch them in the face. No, marketing is about making money by detailed analysis. Yeah. So I, I fix computers, still do that today. If you ever need your phone uh, screen repaired, I can change your phone screen. I can fix a computer. You know, computers are scared of me because they know if they go wrong, they get the screwdriver. Yeah, because I'll be in there and I'll fix it. So fixed thousands of computers in my career. Um, understanding PR understanding media and influencers, being useful. It's all about being useful. Your network, you've got to get into people and you've got to influence them. So you've got to understand what they want. You know, what does a TV company want? Or what does a blogger, um, a, a YouTuber want these days? Because TV is becoming less important. They want to have something that's engaging, that's really going to interest their audience. And you have to understand that you have to be that person for you to get ahead you need to increase your profile all that kind of stuff you need to earn, learn project management it's all right doing all the flim flam but what happens when you have to put a huge uh, project rewilding uh, a woodland or a, or a beaver reintroduction there's a thousand jobs to do and don't get fooled by Gantt charts and other project management tools because it's always much more complicated than that. I, uh, you know, I've been involved in, I did a job with a nuclear power station once, an ecological consultancy job where I met all their project managers and they said all the project management software was garbage. So all these people think project management's learning project management software. No, it's not. It's all about listing all your jobs, knowing what they can be done, knowing the, the complex factors that affect that job against another job. You know, how do you get to import some beavers um, or import, import some bears once rescued them? All the complex legislation and make sure a TV company can be dragging with you. And you've got to deal with all the sensibilities of everybody involved. And you've got all the project of making a bear rescue center and having it all there. Thousands of jobs that need to be done right at the right places. Where do you put your efforts as you make it? Project management's all about you know, listing everything, but also making sure you put your efforts just at the right place. And all the complexities of getting this permit here. Or, and often you can't get the permit, so you have to go you know, reach the boss, entertain them, 
get them to um, give you the piece of paper. Government regulators are impossible. You have to get through the bureaucratic. You have to break through the bureaucracy, meet the right person, show them that you are a decent, honest person who's just trying to do what's right. And they then value that because most of their lives is just boring meetings and dealing with stupid politicians who are just concerned about their reputation, not the reality of what they're doing. So project management, campaigner, so learn campaigning, and then you will become a manager and you will have to manage other people and learn how to deal with people. And eventually you will become a leader. And then you'll find out that everybody hates you and want to suppress all your work because they're all jealous. And they don't want to invite you. And once you start talking about land value tax, all the universities will stop inviting you to give talks. Because you've now challenged the pyramid. The pyramid of power. The pyramid of privilege. Because this country is controlled. Every workplace. We are in a feudal system of control. Not actually. And that's why... We come back to the problem of nature conservation is that the real barrier is politics and it is a self-licking ice cream. Power is a self-licking ice cream. It is a snake eating its own tail in the sense that the political systems and the economic systems we have have learned over generations to protect themselves and to make sure people can't change anything. We are forever getting a world, and that's now an international system where the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, and nature is being destroyed. And every government-sanctioned nature conservation policy, carbon trading, you know, green investment, green new deals, rubbish. You unpick all of those things, it's just putting, so Green New Deals, are uh, people are now speculating in woodland, plantation woodland, that's rubbish for nature. They can't actually absorb carbon because they don't understand soil chemistry and a plantation woodland will release more carbon from the soils than goes into the wood. It needs to be a native woodland, right? It needs to be a wet woodland. It needs to be a complex mix of heath and grassland and woodland, a true rewilding, a dwarf scrub. That absorbs carbon, not plantation woodland. But now they're speculating on all the, the subsidies they're getting, right? So financialization has captured government. And all the policies we give, all the policies of carbon trading, all carbon trading allows is for a few of the wealthy, you know, who own stocks and shares in the, in the big companies, they're now feudal landlords of carbon and now can charge a carbon tax, not to themselves or to the government, but to the people who need carbon use to live. Instead of what we should have is a base carbon tax when it's taken out of the ground, and then everybody should be given a rebate so they aren't in poverty, but the wealthy... And all of our economy now has to pay the costs of carbon as it's, as it's used. And that means we use it more efficiently, but we don't create poverty. Okay, But all the systems of government aren't creating these solutions. They're creating complex, technological, scotch mist solutions that will never happen. They, we're never going to um, make machines that suck carbon in. Thermodynamics. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's basic science. You can't break the laws of physics, Captain. Right? We can't break the laws of physics. We can't trap this carbon back into some ridiculous system or pump it underground. And yet all the subsidies are for this. The government is our enemy. And if we're ever going to solve the problems of the world, we have to seriously get real democracy back into this world. Yeah, we need direct democracy. Forget about representative democracy. It is, it is a representative democracy is not democracy. I don't want MPs. I don't I'm, I've talked to the directors of the Green Party, to the leaders, because I've stuff I've done in the past. It was actually Vivian West, West Westwood who got me there. But anyway, long story. Used to advise her. And they are just as corrupt as every other political party. Maybe they're a bit less corrupt, right? 
but they're still crap. They've still got, you know, uh, wind turbine manufacturing paying for their key personnel to make sure that all the policies and the policies they campaign on will ensure that they can earn money. Not that wind turbines are the total solution to our energy problems. All we need to do is tax carbon, and then we will use less carbon. That's the first thing. Then our technologies will be incentivized to be developed to use less carbon. We shouldn't be picking the winners and losers and all the little bits of corruption that goes on behind the scenes. Sorry, have I ranted enough? <laughs> no, that makes, do you mean by not representative democracy, you mean proportional representation? No, no represents. I don't. So the best system, if you study, I told you, you have to study political science. So the first democracies was the Solon democracy of Athens, right? He recognized that the two key problems to democracy, and it wasn't just Solon, it was many people after him. It's um, easier to say Solon. Um, he represented that the key issue was land ownership. So he restricted land ownership. He restricted debt and people going into uh, debt bondage, slavery, because of getting into debt. He restricted the ability of landowners to take over other people's lands, and he created a economy of small um, workmen, you know, who small artisans who could actually develop uh, the um, economy of the area. And he limited the power of oligarchs, but he also represented... To get that democracy, he understood that representatives, where you elect a representative, that is a fundamentally corrupt process because the rich influence the elections. Yeah. Remember, you get to vote for Jack Johnson or John Jackson. You don't get to vote for Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. And if it ever happens again, they're going to change the system so it never happens again. Look what they've done to poor old Jeremy Corbyn. He was going to be deselected. He's going to be expunged. They'll invest million, hundreds of millions of pounds to get rid of him because the rich know it's in their interest to stop real democracy. So Solon had a jury system. He didn't have elected representatives. There was a qualifying level you had to attain to make sure you weren't a complete idiot. And then by lot, by random choice, by jury, you elected your representatives, right? Or not elected them. They had short terms, only a year. Okay. And that's how you do. So our parliament should be have very stringent laws for people taking money from anybody lobbying. There should be no such thing as lobbying. You should get a 10-year jail sentence if you try. For you as a company or a rich person to try and affect a, a representative, shall we call them, it should be 10 years in prison, yeah. right? Across the board. Any form of political donations out the door, right? We don't want political parties. We don't want uh, anything like that. We should have everybody at a random assembly, people's assembly, where you get like a jury system where you get a year and you get a pension afterwards and you get a payment. But by God, you go to prison if you get caught doing anything wrong. I mean, seriously banged up. Um, no exceptions. Yeah. And that's where you can have real democracy. Now, those people are your representatives for many things you have on the other side. Okay? Whereby we all get to vote on the issues. Never happen, because the rich <laughs> will do everything to stop that. Stop that. But yeah, no, that sounds like a good idea. Kind of like a general assembly. Yes. There are other mechanisms, but I always like to go back to the original Greek Solon systems and they weren't perfect then they had they had representatives it wasn't all uniform you can't just make it all sorry but just remember solemn democracy how did that culture come from the the uh f f you had the bronze age right you had the bronze age claps all writing stopped trade stopped you know we had some ecological disaster that caused the collapse of the bronze age systematic disaster and then it, the athenian culture rose and it mostly is on the shoulders of Solon and implementing a true democratic system where could, people could flourish without oligarchic control. Great. Um, I could ask a lot more questions, but thank you so much for talking with me. Um, I've learned a lot and it sounds like there's a lot of things I need to research. Um, Enjoy your journey 
into being doing something useful for your life and don't be dissuaded yeah do a bit of mindfulness live your life have good things but just keep true to yourself okay thanks a lot take care now you too